How are you guys doing this morning? Good morning. We're talking about faith and the gospel. I've got so many things to share with you guys. Let me start off by saying this way. This is, this is always a great way to start the service or the message part of it. You are not here by chance. God brought you here. And so we've already done our best to welcome the Lord Jesus Christ, to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit to come here. But I don't believe that you're here by chance. I believe that God ordained for you to come. I was talking to a funeral home director the other day, and I'll tell that story in a minute. And uh, he said, you know, Mitch, he says, I've been doing this for over 40 some odd years. He said, I am convinced that there's just a time that God has for you to be born and a time for you to die. He said, I've watched this all. He says, I've just, I've just come to that conclusion. And, you know, the Bible says that, get this, before the foundations of the world, before the worlds were made, that God knew you and formed you. That God knew when he would insert you into, if you would, into human history, that you have a purpose. There's a destiny on your life. And I personally believe through personal choice, you can extend or shorten your years on the earth. But you have a set time that God has for you. And the older I get, the more I realize how much time is just flying by. And you've got just a limited amount of time. And that's not to stress you out. It's to let you enjoy every day. We get in here and we say, and as Ryan did a great job of introducing the service this morning, is that, you know, this is the day the Lord has made. This is today. Did you know that all of his promises are made new today? So maybe yesterday you really messed up. Well, that was yesterday. We're into today. And you're here in church. So what can we, how can you not enjoy that? To let God's promises come alive in your life. Let God just feed your faith. Let God just stir you up. Let God just continue to do his marvelous work of transforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible declares that God desires for all of us to accurately reflect his son, Jesus. That was really good response. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, and when you think about, let me just go back a, a little bit for this. When you think about Jesus, we as a church have done a very poor job of presenting the biblical Jesus. We have shown a Jesus, especially with some of the uh, dark ages, some of the paintings, the medieval paintings that were of Jesus. Jesus always was like kind of a skinny fellow. And he kind of had a long face, and he had a scraggly beard and greasy hair. And this guy, he kind of walked around, and, he, and just like it just kind of made you where you just, you just felt bad for the guy. And, you know, even though he was living in the Middle East, he was always very anemic looking. Real, real white and pale. Would anyone want to be attracted to a Jesus like that? Well, no. But the Bible is full of all kind of a personal eyewitness accounts that when Jesus walked into a place that people were attracted to him, not because he had, if you would, Robert Redford looks, or he looked like some Hollywood star, but it says that he, they were attracted to Jesus because of the words he spoke. There was something about the nature of Jesus. There was something about the character of Jesus. There was something about the care and concern of Jesus that just pulled people right in. They couldn't get enough of being around Jesus. Now you come to church, and it's a whole different story. The Jesus that we're supposed to worship and the Jesus that's supposed to be present here, somehow we've lost that. And then for people to come to church, they're like, I don't know. I just, you know, I don't know. Those, those church people, they just, they get all these attitudes. Well, that's because we're not accurately reflecting Jesus. That means that we've, we have hidden him. He's become obscured in our, in our desires to worship and know him. So my hope and prayer is that every person in this room will want to become more like the biblical Jesus. That you'll be more loving, more kind, more tenderhearted, more engaged, more sensitive to what the Spirit of God wants to use your life purposes for to fulfill his purposes for your life. Did you know the church is on a mission? Jesus has put a church on a mission. We are called, get this, we are called to preach the gospel. The purpose of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to keep the main thing, the main thing, and that's his gospel. When you think of the word gospel, it literally means good news. Did you know that we have good news for every person in every nation? We have good news for every person in every nation. I'll say it again. We 
have good news. Now, here's what happens a lot of times in church life. You guys give it, come with me on You got to help me out. A little crowd this morning, so you guys got to be all amped up. Okay, here we go. When the church doesn't reflect Jesus accurately, it makes our culture not want to know him. It creates problems in our culture because the Jesus that is the biblical Jesus, the church of Jesus, is not accurately reflecting that, therefore causing the culture not to have any interest in this Jesus Christ. And so you see it a lot of times in church life, and I'm making fun of ourselves as church people, but you know, we're going to church, you know, instead of, like we say, okay, we're going to church. I'm going to church this morning. Now, if I were to tell you, you could go to a concert, go to a ball game, you could go see the World Series, you could go see all this stuff, man, there'd be this excitement and enthusiasm. Still, we're going to church. Honey, get the kids ready, we're going to church. And then you come to church, and you're out, you know, maybe out in the parking lot, and I'm watching you guys. I watch people in the lobby. Man, they're all happy and excited and jumping around. And some about these doors, they walk in, and there's... <laughs> I'm in church. And we just have this, we, we're like we've been dipped in lemon juice. And we just, our faces are these long, sad faces, and we're just, you know, I'm in church. And let me just say this, a lot of times we have people going through issues, and I get that. People going through divorce, people going through marital problems, people raising their kids, and their kids are acting crazy, and they've, they've got financial pressures, and they've got physical problems, and they've got all these things that are just their struggles. We understand. But for the church of Jesus Christ, there has to be this passion that life is not about you, it's about Him. And I've been called to reflect him and to show him and to demonstrate his love and his kindness. And so when you get your mind and your thoughts off yourself, it's amazing how God can use you to do incredible things. It's amazing how God can just transform the situation you're in and make your life better. Because you're not always possessed thinking about self. So as I talk about the message some more about the gospel, just realize it's the good news. So Jesus said this. He's talking to his disciples in Matthew 24, 14. And he gives us this scripture. And it's, he answers three specific questions in Matthew 24 that the disciples asked him. One was about the end of the age. One was about Jesus, when are you coming back? And the third question is, Jesus, we're kind of in bad circumstances now. What's happening to us right now? And so Jesus breaks down Matthew 24 and he tells them this. But this is a scripture that he gives about the end of the age. He says, this gospel of the kingdom, notice he says the gospel of the kingdom, when we're talking about that series coming about the kingdom come, thy kingdom come. It's a powerful series, you don't want to miss it. But thy kingdom come, this, is, will be, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. The word nations, there is ethnic groups, to every ethnic group on the planet earth. And then the end will come. There's so much revelation in this verse, but the Word of God tells us that the first key, the first release for the end times to conclude or that, or that era to come to an end is when the gospel is preached to every nation. The Wycliffe Bible translators, Tyndale publishers are documenting all the people groups that do not have either a Bible or a church in their midst. And the last time I looked, it was a little over 5,000 people groups have never had the gospel printed in print form, in language form, or they don't have a New Testament church in their midst. But God is doing some things on planet Earth. And it says one of the keys to seeing the return of Jesus Christ, it says is this gospel will be preached to every nation. So the mission we have as a church is to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means the good news of Jesus Christ. That means every situation when our team goes to Madagascar, every situation they encounter, no matter what they're encountering, they have good news. No matter what they're facing, a person with diseases, we're going to say Jesus is your healer. A people that are going through unemployment, they need money, we're going to tell them that God has a way to prosper you and to cause you to be employable, to gain some talents, resources, abilities that you can use so that you can have gainful employment. We have some good news for you when you begin to go through your marital life. And I can just go on and on, or your emotional life, and you're depressed and fearful and worried. We have good news for you. Why is that? Because the gospel works. The Lord Jesus Christ will endorse his word. I've been in too many situations, too many places all over the world, not just in America, where God has shown up and done some incredible things because Jesus loves to work with his church. 
Jesus loves to be a part. Listen to what it says, and let me just talk about the gospel for a second. Did you realize that when you gave your heart to Christ, and you asked Jesus to come live in your life as a believer, that God changed you from the inside out? Everything that you had done wrong, everything you had spoken, everything way you have acted, everything that you had done in a, that just brought conviction or guilt to your conscience, in that moment, you get a clean slate. You get erased. You never again have to go through the rest of your life carrying that stuff with you. That's what makes Christianity different than every other religion in the world. It's a thing called forgiveness. The blood of Jesus will separate you from your past. Some people here and some people in the live stream need to hear that. There's a demarcation when you give your life to Christ that takes your past life and it is removed under the blood of Jesus. There's a cleansing. And for a lot of people, they've never experienced that because they've never understood the gospel. But the gospel message is more than just forgiveness of sin, as important as that is. The gospel hits every part of human life. It hits your emotional life, your relational life, your physical life, your financial life. Every aspect of life, the gospel message implies or or speaks to those areas. So as a church, we have the gospel. We have good news. We have an incredible message that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. He's alive right now. So as you speak and teach and preach, Jesus is right there with you to endorse you, to back you up as you step out and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. That was good, Pastor Mitch. Thank you. There's just so many many incredible things that God does for people when they have just a little bit of faith in a great big God. God shows up, and you see the presence of God, and God just does his his marvelous ability, and you're just amazed. And all of a sudden you realize, speaking the gospel, it's not about me. It's not about my life, not about my adventures, even not about my Bible knowledge. It's all about him. And he does his work, his incredible work. Let me tell you a quick story. I was in, uh, I was in a, one of those kind of mini fast food restaurants the other day with another a pastor friend. And I saw one of the wait staff walking by and I recognized him. And I knew that his family were a strong Christian family in another church. And I read a report this summer that he'd gotten in some serious trouble. He'd fled from the police, he'd gotten arrested, spent time in jail, and I knew this young man, and I knew his family. I said, when you got just a minute, you run around here, so it was kind of slow, I said, can I speak to you? He said, sure. So he stopped by the table, and I just said, what happened this summer? It was in the public, it was in the newspaper, I wouldn't gossip, it was just, what happened this summer? He goes, I was with some work friends, they went to the bar down at one of the Mexican restaurants downtown, I got there late. Had maybe he said maybe I had a you know like maybe I had a drink. Yeah, maybe I had a drink. I did not. And I'm with my friends. We're walking down the street, and this guy was on this bicycle, and he was harassing us. And he was making fun of one of the ladies I was with, and so I just punched him. And then I realized I shouldn't have done that. And then he says, so then I was trying to leave the scene, you know, trying to get away from this guy, and this other guy started chasing me on a bicycle, so I started running. Well, the guy that was chasing me on the bicycle, the second guy was the police. So he went to jail for three weeks. And this guy had, had his journey. He wanted to be a, you know, he wanted to be in the State Department, do all these other incredible things. And I had to tell him, I said, you know what? Too bad. I mean, well, that's not good news. I'm sorry, you're just a loser. I'm going to enjoy jail. I mean, well, that's not, that's not it. I know as a Christ follower, you can't give in to what everybody else says. I have to know the Bible, know the Word of God. I looked him right in the eye and said, you know what? If you will get your life aligned with the purposes of God, if you'll just come under and let all your life invest in the kingdom of God, go for Jesus, live for Jesus, love God, he can take this situation that you're in, you'll spend the next 18 months having to stay here in State College, he gets through all this trial. I said, God can use this for your good, and he will restore you, and he'll do some incredible things in your life. That's the gospel. That's the good news, guys. No matter what circumstances you're facing, let me just go to another story because some of you need to hear this. You need to have some hope about your circumstances. I just sensed that this morning. 
I did a funeral yesterday for a 41-year-old man. He was in the prime of health. This guy was a stud, man. I mean, he was, this guy was a Marine. He was an Army vet. He was uh, in shape. He was a triathlon kind of guy. I mean, this guy, and he fell asleep when he was driving his work truck, smashed into an electric pole and died instantly. Left behind an eight-year-old daughter. I did the funeral. It was part of our church, Glenn Miller. What would you say in that situation, pastor? Where's the good news in that? Well, let me just say this. Death is an enemy. There's nothing good about death. We fight against that enemy called death. It is an enemy. And it seeks to steal, kill, and destroy and rob us of relationships here on earth. But that's not the end of the story. Because I happen to know that Glenn gave his heart to Christ. I'll tell you a quick story. He was on the boxing team at Penn State. He made the Marine Corps boxing team. And when he was struggling, this is a couple of years ago, and so he came out in the lobby, talked to me, says, Pastor Mitch, he says, I want to give my life to Christ, but I, I'm just so angry. I just want to punch people in the face. I said, wait a minute, I got just a guy for you. Jim, Jim, go get, go, Jim, go get, go get Glenn, and you go talk, Jim, Mr. Karate Expert, you go talk to Glenn, you guys work it out. Just, you know, whatever you got to do to, you know, help him out. So he prays with Glenn, and Glenn's palatable, but Glenn gave his heart to the Lord. Just says, I want to serve Jesus. And so every night, he would get his little girl, and he would sit there and just read the Bible to her and just share with her how Jesus had changed his life. He talked about the ways that he just ministered to people and just loved on people. Instead of being angry and trying to, you know, fight all this aggressive stuff, that God just changed his nature. So when he died, it was death. An enemy took one of our guys. But here's the good news. We will see Glenn again in the resurrection. It's not final. It's not permanent we will see him again, those who are followers of Christ Jesus. So in the midst of pain and suffering, we can have good news. Are you guys with me on this? I'm just telling you, it works. As sad as, as it is, as, as lonely as it is, that journey. And God's doing some things in my prayers. Every time a saint dies, my prayer is, God, out of death, bring forth life. The Lord, I pray for every person that has died prematurely or not died in their, in their purpose, in their time. That God, I pray that you would destroy the works of hell. I pray that you bring life and resurrection out of this death. That what Satan meant for evil, you will turn to good. And God, that we will see your kingdom purposes prosper in this situation. And just stand on the word and just stand on the word and just stand for it. Well, the Bible goes on to tell us in Philippians 1.27, it says, Whatever happens... Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you, this is the Apostle Paul wrote into the church at Philippi. He says, or hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. This is why we assemble together, so we can encourage one another in the midst of our life circumstances that we can have hope. Thank you, Pastor Dean. <laughs> Would you just turn to your neighbor and say, man, I'm going to try to give you the best hope I've got today. Just turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to give you the best hope i got today. God has good purposes for your life. God has incredible purposes for your life. Live in that realm. Focus on that realm. Stand in that realm. God has incredible purposes for your life. The gospel, so we come together, we're striving for the faith in the gospel. Because we have good news for every nation, every man. I've been all over the world, and I can just tell you it works. Everywhere I go, the gospel works. No matter what situation I walk into, the gospel works. And it's more than just forgiveness of sins. There's so much that's loaded into the good news that Jesus Christ has for his people to share with those around him. Just an incredible joy. To walk around thinking, man, I've got the gospel. I've got good news for every person I meet. And just see God just do some amazing things. As you walk, let me just tell you, this is, this, to me, this is so funny. I got to tell this. I got to brag on the campus group. 
We had a leaders meeting yesterday morning. By the way, we're inviting as many people that want to be in leadership development come. We've got some incredible staff and strategies and teachings that we do just to help develop our leaders. So we have a lot of times for encouragement. So the staff were sharing this, and I just thought this was humorous. Our campus group has got it convinced in their minds that when they see anybody that's got crutches or a cast on or a brace, that's an immediate invitation for them to go pray for them. I mean, they just see them walking around campuses like, like radar, like homing pitches. They are flying to that person to talk to them. So uh, Sam Lucas was sharing this story. He goes, yeah, he goes, I'm on campus, and I see this person. They got a, I think they had, a, had some crutches. He says, I ran up to him and says, hey, he started talking to him. He said, can I pray for you? And the person goes, no, I've already been prayed for. He goes, what? They go, yeah, they go, uh, one of the other people in this group, VCF or something, they, kind of got, they wanted to pray for me, and they prayed for me, and yeah, I'm doing good. He, he said this happened to him like three or four times this week. Every person he wanted to pray for, they'd already been prayed for. Now, on that massive campus, to have that kind of response, how many know that's amazing? Give the Lord a hand for that. That's just so amazing. Because we are convinced that we have good news. Well, the Bible tells us where all this comes from. Do you know what comes from the Bible? Did you realize the Bible's not a history book? The Bible's a living document. The Bible gives us instruction for how to conduct ourselves, how to live life. So when you read these stories in the Bible, these narratives in the Bible, it's to instruct you not how we're to conduct ourselves. Let me tell you another quick story. No, I just feel inspired to share this. I, I'm, somehow I got off message. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. No, no, I'm just ignore these people down front. I'm just not, I'm not looking at them. But there was, I remember my dad was telling me the story one time that he was with this business owner. And this guy was wanting to, you know, come to Christ. And his business was failing. His marriage was failing. And all this stuff. And my dad just stopped him and said, why does Jesus want your failing business? And why does Jesus want your failing marriage? He said, why don't you give God the best? Give God when you're at the top of your game, not when you're at the bottom. Give God when you're doing your best. So if you've got, you know, you got a business and you're trying, okay, yeah, it's going good, I'm going to keep it for myself, that's not the right attitude. So when you're at the top of your game, you give things to God. Anybody turn to God when things are bad, come to Jesus. They call it jailhouse religion. But how about when things are going good? How about when things are going well in your life? You don't have any needs. Are you still preaching the gospel? Are you still fervent, still excited about the things of God? Still feel like, you know, Jesus and you are a team and you're following him and loving him. So all of a sudden we come as a church, we come out of being a need-based to where we become faith-based. Faith-based is, man, God's going to meet every need. We're so excited to be here this morning. God's got some incredible things. I can't wait to worship. I can't wait to praise him. <laughs> Glory to God. He got some good news for me. Because I'm coming on the basis of faith. I'm coming on the basis of faith, not need. So I come and I say, God, thank you. Thank you for this incredible privilege. Listen to this story. I'm trying to wrap up. This is, this is in Acts 3. It says the disciples were going to pray. How many know that prayer is a good thing? We had a men's prayer. We had a men's uh, group meeting uh, yesterday morning. I had a chance to talk about prayer. Prayer is essential. Prayer is not just telling God everything you need. Prayer is where you listen to God. Let God speak to you. Let God direct you. He knows what you're going to go through that day. Believe it or not. Did you know God created time? God knows the beginning from the end. He knows where you're at right now, today. He knows what you need. And if you will open your ear and listen, he will get you ready. Let me give you a quick example. The Lord spoke to me and said, you need to bring another shirt to church this morning. And I didn't do it. So after first service, I was soaked. Man, I looked nasty. So I had to go get in my car and drive home and change shirts because I didn't obey the Lord. I was kind of like, mm, if I just obey the Lord, he would save me all this stress of trying to drive back and forth to come in here and act all spiritual. You know what I'm saying? My point in sharing with you is that the Lord knows what you're going to go through. And if you will just obey, it will go well with you. And if you have an ear to hear to listen to him, he'll do amazing things through your life. So disciples are going, I'm trying to get the story. So disciples are going to pray. Now forget the scriptures, I'll just tell the story. So I'm just teasing. But anyway, so the disciples are going to pray. And says, and there was a lame man there who'd been sitting at this temple gate called Beautiful for decades. 
Did you realize that this man sat under the teachings of Jesus and didn't get healed? Jesus was in the city. The guy was there. So that just tells you, and this is why I'm talking about being led by the Spirit. Just because you see a need, it doesn't mean that you're to meet that need. Jesus just passed by and the guy didn't get healed. A few years later, Peter and John go in to pray. They come in. The guy says, hey, do you have any silver and gold? I need some money so I can survive. Peter looks at him and says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus walk. And says this lame man who'd been there for decades jumped up after Peter pulled him up. His ankle bones were strengthened. This is he went walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. This is all these people gathered, this crowd gathered, and they were just amazed as they began, this is they began to gather and say, Look, we know that guy, and he was that crippled guy that was a beggar. Now he's this you know, like you know, ballerina dancer guy. What what's going on here? And Peter gets to him, and this is the verse I want to get you because I think Peter has some incredible insight when he shares this verse. Listen to what he says in verse 16. He says, By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Peter gets some incredible insights into this gospel message. When you use the name of Jesus, faith is released. If you don't use Jesus' name like a curse word or like a slang, but you honor it and revere it, you give it the place that it's worthy of, the name of Jesus, the name that's given among men, the only name given among whereby we can't be saved, the only name of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, the name that we adore, the name that we revere, the name that we bow our knee to at the name of Jesus. When you give it that place and that honor in your life and you speak it, God shows up on the scene. And God does some amazing things. But it says also, it says it's not just faith in his name, but faith that comes through him because when Jesus comes on the scene, faith is released. That's what's so inspiring to me is that when you step out and you begin to attempt to speak for God and share the good news and you're sharing the gospel and you're ministering to other people around you, God is working with you, beside you, through you. He will do the work that only he can do. And then you realize that, man, so Peter's standing there and they're all just, just speaking to these guys and they're all standing around. Peter says, look, this man wasn't healed by our own piety. And let me just go to another, just another strategic thought. It's the cross of Jesus plus nothing that gets you saved. There is nothing you can do to add to the work that Jesus did on the cross. So when you think it's on the basis of your works, you're sadly mistaken. It's because of the cross that you're able to do the works that God can do. It's because of the cross that you can see God do the things he wants to do through you. And that's what's so exciting. That's what's so enthusiastic to me is you see God do these amazing works. And you realize, God, you are so unbelievably amazing that you would use me to see you do these incredible things. And that's what Peter was telling them. So you go further in the story. Let's just read a few more verses, and we're closing. It says this. He says that he tells them, here's the gospel message. Peter speaks to them. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, that he may send the Messiah who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he's promised long ago through his holy prophets. This message that he says has got so much things in it, but it, the bottom line is that at times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Just feel this strong. If, you, if you're feeling like, I feel like a real weariness, that's usually a key indication that your time with the Lord has been cut short. Because when you get weary in mind, weary in emotion, Jesus brings refreshing, believe it or not. Jesus doesn't drain you of life. He fills you full of life. Jesus doesn't take away. He gives. So when you're going through life and you feel like you're really depleted, it's usually because you haven't spent your time with the Lord letting God fill you up full of his life. Because it's such a supernatural journey, this faith of the gospel, to let the presence of God come in your life in such a real way that as you go through your day-to-day -day task, you're feeling, uh, not that you don't get tired occasionally, but you're not drained, you're not worn out, you're not weary. You just have a supernatural strength that only God can give. 
That's the faith of the gospel. It also says that all these times are refreshing, but it says heaven must receive Jesus until the restoration of all things. Let me just talk to you about worldview for a second. God is restoring the earth to its original purpose and intention. God is in the process of restoring planet earth. All the global warming advocates, all the people looking at all the uh, the proliferation of nuclear war, the people are talking about the growth of human population. There's just so many issues in food and all this stuff. All I can tell you is that God is working in such a way that he's going to restore all things to its original purpose. And as believers and followers of Christ, I'm telling you, it's worth your while to read the Bible to see how it ends. If you get to the end book, the book of Revelation, it says that we win. That he restores all things. That Jesus comes back and does what only he can do. So as people of faith and people of hope and people of purpose, we can't be depressed like everybody else. The Apostle Paul wrote in Thessalonians, going back to the funeral, he says, you know, you can't be like people in the world who have no hope. He says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. He's going to blow the trumpet, and all that are dead in Christ will rise when they hear his voice. And we who are alive will remain, be caught up with him in the air. Jesus is coming back, and he's restoring all things. I can tell you, just, I've just got to give you this hope and this vision and this future. Do not let the talking heads of TV dictate to you your worldview. It doesn't work. It's depressing. Who cares about Harvey Weinstein? That's not news. Now, the people he abused, yes, I get it. I'm not making fun of them. But, guys, you cannot allow the news media to dictate to you your life, your purpose. Your faith has got to be in the gospel. He's got to take the words of Jesus and live by them and use them and walk by them and watch God do his amazing work. It's a lot more fun. You know, my dad used to tell me, you know, people always say, well, you know, living for God is such a drag. It's so old. My dad would say, you know, I served the devil for all these years, like first 20 years of my life, and I can just tell you, that's a drag. And that gets real old real quick. You ever met people in their late 20s that are still living like they're in high school? And you think, why don't you grow up? You know, when you give your life to Christ, you know God matures you real quick. All of a sudden, you put aside all this foolish stuff, and you just start walking with God, and you start believing Him and following Him, and all of a sudden, you realize, you know what? I'm not caught up in all this stuff I used to be caught up in. The things of God are more important to me than what my peers think. The things of God mean more to me than what other people are trying to teach me. I love the Lord. Obey Him. Walk with him. It's like our team going to Madagascar. They could have chosen not to go. They could have gone at a later date. We prayed it through and felt like God was giving us an assurance they need to go. This is the time they need to go and speak and share and minister. So it's an adventure. If you're following the true Jesus, you're never bored. Trust me. I was so tired when I woke up this morning, I didn't want to come to church. I just want to lay in bed. People say, you're the pastor. I know. Just being real. And then I realized, guess what? Jesus was going to be here. And God's people were going to be here. And it would pick me up to another level than what I had previously. That's the whole purpose of church is to encourage you. Encourage you in your faith. Encourage you in your walk. Last scriptures we begin to close. Wherever I got in this. Okay, first of Acts 4.30 and 20 says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. This is the key of the gospel. God wants you to see and hear things. God wants you to be the one to speak his word. God wants you to be on this journey of faith where he uses your lips, your mouth, your energy, your qualities, to extend his kingdom purpose. God uses you and you're on this faith journey. So you have these adventures with Jesus. I mean, I didn't realize sitting in a restaurant that I'd run into this guy who'd been arrested and all this stuff going on in his life, but it was a divine purpose. 
had a pastor call me up. and said, Pastor Mitch, can I get with you? Can I get with you? I said, yeah. He said, I've just been to Madagascar. I've run across about three or four people in your church. Can I come? I need to talk to you. He started sharing with me. He said all this stuff. He says, you know, it's just, it's just the divine appointments as we got together. Just did, he just was just so full of encouragement of what God was doing in his life, his church, his ministry, but also what he saw God doing here with us. You need that encouragement daily. We've got to encourage one another. The Bible says encourage one another to love and good deeds. You guys want to hear a cool story? Am I, am I close to being done? Where am I at? What do I mean to want to do? The Bible tells us, we'll finish up. If, this, is, this is for the music team. 1 Timothy 6.12. 1 Timothy 6.12. That's for the music team. That verse is coming up. The Bible tells us fight the good fight of faith. Here's the, here's the thing, is that how many know that we received a spontaneous, on-the-spur offering for this African-American man that was riding his bicycle down the road, a, a bigoted, racist guy in a pickup truck tried to run him off. He ran off the road. He hit a tree, had a concussion. He was self-employed. He was trying to work. So one of the families in our church, the Thors, Patty and Jim Thor, this guy worked for him. He does some subcontracting on different properties or things that they own. They said, this is just this, is this guy. Would you just pray for him? We got this in between services last Sunday. I just felt like we should receive an offering. So I just came together and because we, our care fund has been extinguished. And so if you'd like to give to the care fund, we can appreciate it. But we didn't have money in the care fund. So I'm like, let's just receive an offering. Guess what? We had over $1,000 come in for that guy. Wow. This gentleman, this gentleman that I don't know, you guys, you guys gave over $1,000 came in to help that gentleman. That is the gospel in action. That's the purpose of the church. That's what God's called us to do, to be a blessing everywhere we go. Say it again as I'm trying to close. It just keeps coming out, but you cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God with your time, your finances, your ability, your emotions. There's not any realm that you can do for Jesus that you, re- you wind up being depleted. You cannot outgive God. So to me, the things you've seen and heard, be a witness of those things. It's like this morning we had some healings that wanted to come up. My Pastor Dina come up. We're going to say a prayer in just a minute, but we're going to share some of the healings. She has some words for some more healings. So if you guys will stand, I'm trying to close. Trying to close. See what the Lord wants to do. We'll pray for you in just a second. We want you to hear some of these things that God's doing. Okay, we are so excited. So this morning, first service, I had some words for uh, people that had shin splints and for somebody that had a right elbow, had some something going on there, and we had people come forward with both of those things and got touched and healed them. Yeah, I think that's exciting. Jesus is still healing today. So we have a ministry team if you guys want to come forward because um, I believe in, if you still have those things, that wasn't just for first service. If you've got chin splints, problems with your right elbow, if you're watching um, on live stream and you have that, just believe with us in prayer. God wants to bring healing. We also have words for high blood pressure. I believe there's somebody here right now that has tingling in their feet. God wants to bring healing to that. Also for a left ankle, something going on there. He wants to heal. And if you have any ulcers in your GI tract, I believe that God wants to bring healing to that. And yes, I sorry, I do have. Um, I also know that God wants to bring, if you are just hearing the testimonies that were given, um, that there is a boldness that we are looking for and that if you come forward and pray with somebody and it takes a boldness, it takes a step of faith to step out of your comfort zone, come forward, that God wants to release that boldness in your life and he also wants to bring times of refreshing. If you're here, Pastor Mitch shared that earlier, he has a time of refreshing for you. Come forward for prayer. That's good. That's good. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this moment. If you guys would take just a second, this won't be long, but I just need to just double check with every person in the room. My friend Glenn passed away accidentally. Death came too soon. If you're here in this room this this morning and you're not for sure if you were to die and you stepped out into eternity, that you would go to heaven, this is your moment to make things right. Or like the young man I met in the restaurant whose life was not aligned with the purposes of God and got himself in trouble. This is your moment to make it right. This is your moment to say, okay, Jesus, just repeat these words in your heart. This is Isaac to say, Jesus, 
I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to fill me. Jesus, I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. And you start that journey of faith with the rest of us who are trying to trust Jesus and follow Jesus and obey Jesus.